Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the sixth talk in our series of lectures marking the centenary of Northern Ireland. It gives me great pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker, Fergal McGarry, Professor of Modern Irish History at Queen's University, Belfast. Professor McGarry has written widely on modern Ireland, in particular on the Great War, 1916, and the Irish Revolutionary Period, and has a great interest in the politics of commemoration. Professor McGarry has given a number of excellent lectures on his research at Lisburn Museum on a number of occasions, and we've really looked forward to another thrilling talk this evening. So please welcome Fergal McGarry, everyone. Thanks very much for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to be back um, speaking in uh, Lisbon uh, once again, although um, obviously doing remotely rather than um, in person. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'll make a start. I'm going to look at my, the title of my talk today is An Irish Tragedy, The Assassination of Sir Henry um, Wilson. At 2.20 on Thursday afternoon, 22nd of June, 1922, Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, former chief of the Imperial General Staff, was shot dead on the doorstep of his Belgravia home by IRA Commandant Reggie Dunn and volunteer Joe O'Sullivan. And the ripples of this shocking event quickly reverberated beyond London back to Ireland when the British government issued a statement blaming the killing on what it described as the extreme section of the IRA, by which they meant the anti-treaty IRA leadership. So Wilson's assassination escalated a standoff between the provisional government and the anti-treaty IRA leadership, who had at that point taken over uh, the four courts. Um, and Winston's Churchill, when Winston Churchill threatened Michael Collins that British troops would move against the four courts if the provisional government failed to, it essentially set in motion the chain of events leading to the outbreak of the civil war. So it was an incredibly momentous um, event. Now, Churchill's threat to Collins was no idle threat. The commander-in-chief uh, in Ireland, Neville McCready, recorded in his memoirs how he was called to London and instructed to formulate plans to capture the four courts. Aware that such an attack would plunge Ireland deep into crisis, potentially reuniting pro- and anti-treaty fact IRA factions, McCready, according to his own account, at any rate, um, stalled. But this pressure from Downing Street contributed to Collins' decision to move against the four courts the following week, precipitating the Irish Civil War. Now, back in London, and indeed further afield internationally, Wilson's killing had stunned the political establishment and the general public. Noting the peculiarly British horror of political assassination, the historian Keith Jeffrey has suggested that Wilson's shooting was seen as a profoundly un-British event the kind of thing that perhaps happened on the continent, but not on the streets of London. And in fact, it, it was the first assassination of a Westminster MP since the killing of British Prime Minister Spencer, Spencer Percival in 1812. And the next would not occur until 1979 when Airy Meade was killed by the INLA. But back in Ireland, the killing of MPs was becoming less remarkable. Unionist MP William Twaddle had been assassinated by the IRA in Belfast just weeks earlier, while a pro-treaty TD was killed in December, several months later. The impact of Wilson's assassination on British politicians, so I think, was, was profound. British politicians had rarely been targeted by Republicans, and up to that point hadn't felt much need to take personal security precautions in their daily lives. McCready, for example, recorded when he reached Downing Street that he found the Prime Minister and certain members of the government in a state of suppressed agitation on which considerations of personal safety seemed to contend with the desire to do something dramatic as a set off against the assassination of Henry Wilson. And I think that the striking asymmetry of power at work in the killing of Wilson may have added to the sense of shock and vulnerability that was felt by British politicians. After all, this was one of the British Empire's most senior military figures who had been killed on his own doorstep by a one-legged 24-year-old army veteran. Um, and this was an account from, this picture was an illustration from a popular um, pirate's um, uh, magazine and you, you, it, it conveys the very dramatic way in which the 
the act of the assassination was 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 visually kind of uh, reconstructed. Now, sensational press accounts described how Wilson, returning home following the unveiling of the war memorial at Liverpool Street Station, had drawn his ceremonial sword in self-defence. And just out of the picture frame, um, Wilson in his right hand is holding uh, his sword. And th this drawing of the sword was an important, if perhaps embellished detail, as it made Wilson, according to some accounts anyway, Britain's only field marshal to die in action. You cowardly swine, Wilson was reported by the Daily Mail to have shouted as he faced down his attackers. However, the reality, at least as described by uh, eyewitnesses who corroborated the description left by one of Wilson's assassins, Reggie Dunn, was more mundane. Reggie Dunn later wrote in a letter, Wilson made for the door as best he could and actually reached the doorstep when I encountered him at a range of seven or eight feet. I fired three shots rapidly, the last one from the hip as I took a step forward. Wilson was now uttering short cries and in a doubled up position staggered towards the edge of the pavement. At this point, Joe fired once again and the last of I saw him, and the last I saw of him, he'd collapsed. Crowds lined the streets to observe Wilson's cortege process to St. Paul's Cathedral where the British establishment had gathered. His pallbearers included Lord French, General Sir Neville McCready, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig, and Field Marshal Sir William Robertson. So really amongst the most uh, um, celebrated British soldiers of the First World War era. And indeed the scale of the ceremony, as you can see here in this picture, reflected Wilson's stature as one of the most senior British military officers of his day, and a figure who was really at the, at the heart of London's conservative and unionist establishment. Wilson's killing was widely condemned in Britain, where it was seen to undermine Ireland's status as a civilised nation, to quote one press report. And frequently, the killing was compared to the Invincibles Phoenix Park murderers in 1882. So there's very much an idea that the, this, this type of violence, the assassination, the circumstances in which it carried out were deeply uncivilized, as opposed to the conventional military conflict of the First World War. And this was not just a British view, this was also the view widely shared back in Ireland, where, his, where Wilson's, uh, the method of Wilson's assassination was much condemned. The former Irish part, the Irish party MP, for example, Stephen Gwynne, described the killing as a crime against Ireland. In contrast to Wilson, who we can, as we can see from this picture, was, was, was buried as a hero, the fate of Dunn and O'Sullivan met with much less public sympathy in Ireland. Whereas the British and Northern Irish governments sought to identify themselves with Wilson's life and his legacy, both the provisional government and the anti-treaty IRA leadership quickly distanced themselves from responsibility for the actions of Dunn and O'Sullivan. Interestingly, however, we find that de Valera uh, issued an ambivalent statement, noting that while he did not approve of the killing, he would not pretend to misunderstand why it came about, given the violence endured by the nationalist minority in Belfast. And so de Valera in his statement is very keen to place blame on the Northern Irish state for failing to protect the Catholic community. So he's, while he's careful not to say he in any way approves of Wilson's killing, he's saying it's a really, it's, it's an unavoidable consequence of the, the way in which the Catholic community in Belfast had been abandoned. And of course, the first six months of 1922 saw very high levels of violence in Belfast, much of it directed against the Catholic community there. But by and large, it's Wilson who gets the attention and Dunn and O'Sullivan uh, come to a much more ignominious uh, end when they were hanged in Wandsworth Prison on the 10th of August. Although, as we can see from the following picture, they were not entirely deserted by family members and by some uh, London Republicans. And these are the pictures uh, from Wandsworth um, Prison at, on, on, on the day of the execution. So in this talk, I want to uh, consider the killing of Wilson, but, but more so its aftermath, how it was uh, uh, experienced by uh, politicians and my family and how it was remembered um, subsequently. 
So the kind of questions I want to look at is who was Sir Henry Wilson? Who were his killers and why did they target uh, Wilson? How did the death of Wilson and the death of his killers impact on their families subsequently? And then I want to end by considering how we might recall this event as we approach its centenary next summer. So in the course of this uh, talk, I really want to make three broad points. Um, first, that Wilson's death illustrates the complexity of Irish identities during the revolutionary era. Uh, Wilson, who for many Irish Republicans epitomized British imperial repression in Ireland, was actually from Longford, while his IRA killers were both Londoners. So in other words, we can see immediately from this incident how national identities didn't map neatly onto Ireland and Britain, but intersected in complicated ways across the two islands that were within the UK at that time. Wilson considered himself Irish and British. Uh, Dunn, uh, who considered himself Irish rather than British, despite his British birth, um, complained that Irish Republican snobbery over his English birth resulted in a lack of proper recognition of his status and that of many of the London-born IRA in London. So we can see all sorts of interesting tensions about national identity from the perceptions of both how these figures saw their own identity, but how they were perceived by those around them. The second major point I want to develop in this talk is that although we tend to consider the First World War, the War of Independence, and the sectarian violence that takes place in Belfast between 1920 and 1922, and then the civil war that follows immediately after that, as conflicts that are somewhat independent of each other. For some of those people who lived through this decade, these conflicts were interconnected in interesting and important ways. And strikingly, Wilson and his killers had all served in the same army during the First World War, where O'Sullivan had lost his leg. And that war service would feature in Dunn's testimony at his murder trial as a justification for his actions in 1922, as we'll see a little bit later. The third major point I want to make is that although the violence of the revolutionary period is often commemorated in polarizing and indeed simplistic terms over the past century, if we look more closely at family experiences and family memory, we get a more complicated picture of events. The bereaved relatives often contested the uses to which the memory of those they mourned was put, the claims that were made about them. And they frequently resented their treatment by those who claimed the legacy of the dead in public. And I just want to add before I proceed that this talk draws extensively on the research of two former colleagues from Queen's University Belfast, the late Keith Jeffrey, who's the author of Sir Henry Wilson's um, um, uh, biography, and the late Peter Hart, who is the author of the most insightful analysis of the very murky circumstances leading to Wilson's death. So let's uh, take as our starting point, who was Sir Henry um, Wilson? Wilson was born in 1864 in Currygrain near Balnley, County Longford, into the middling class of Protestant Irish landowners. He begins his military career in the early 1880s, entering the army through the Longford militia, serving at home and in India. He attended the Staff College in 1891 to 1893, where he laid the foundations, Keith Jeffrey notes, for a career as one of the most outstanding staff officers of his generation. During the Boer War, Wilson joins the staff of Lord Roberts, and he remains under him when Roberts returns to Britain as commander in chief of the army. As director of military operations at the war office, Wilson devised the plans which shaped Britain's response to the First World War. And his important military career continues after the end of the First World War. In 1918, he became chief of the Imperial General Staff. So he was essentially the, the professional head of the British army in which position he contended both with the post-war retrenchment of the army and an imperial crisis that spanned from Ireland to India, Egypt and the Middle East. Now, Wilson was a deeply uh, uh, political 
uh, and controversial army officer whose reputation for intrigue was well earned. During the Curra mutiny in 1913, for example, he had repeatedly, he had reportedly encouraged senior officers to resign rather than to move against the Ulster Volunteer Force. And he, he is believed to have worked behind the scenes closely with Tory politicians throughout the um, Curra crisis. He was an influential military advisor for the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George, who had supported his appointment as Chief of the Imperial General Staff, although they would fall out badly over Ireland. Preoccupied with the crisis in Ireland, Wilson saw it as forming part of a wider imperial crisis. So I think he's a particularly interesting person in terms of how his views about Ireland are shaped by his views about empire and how his views about empire are shaped by his views about Ireland. Reflecting a widely shared imperialist men mentality at the senior levels of the British Army and indeed British conservatism more generally, Wilson linked the Russian Revolution the anti-colonial revolutions and uprisings that were beginning to take place across the British Empire, labour discontent and strikes within Britain and the revolt in Ireland. So he, 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 he brought all these quite disparate conflicts together, detecting a, a broader conspiratorial plot to undermine the social and political fabric of Britain and its empire. He urged draconian repression of the Republican movement, but interestingly, not by the black and tans whose lack of discipline and excess as he deplored. He thought if you're going to repress an insurrection, you should do so properly using the military army and, 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 and military uh, discipline. Seeing Ireland as an existential threat for the empire as a whole, he was disgusted when David Lloyd George decided to negotiate re with Republicans in the summer of 1921 and is believed to have refused to speak to the British Prime Minister throughout the remainder of his time in office as Chief of the Imperial General Staff. So he, essentially he saw the, the truce of 21 and the treaty which, which um, followed from that truce as uh, a, a betrayal. Um, and and he, he was particularly resentful of the idea of British politicians sitting down with, with, with people he regarded as killers and, and making a deal with them as, as, as equals. When he retired from the army in 1922, Wilson accepted the Ulster Unionist offer of a parliamentary seat in North Down, which he won unopposed. He became Chief, Sec Chief Security Advisor to the Northern Ireland Government, and it was this final role that attracted the attention of the London IRA in London in the summer of 1922, and which ultimately sealed his fate. Why was Wilson killed? I mean, this could be seen as one of the Irish Revolution's great murder mysteries. Discussion of Wilson's fate has centered on, largely on the question of who ordered his killing, because of course we know the identity of his two assassins. And several competing explanations quickly emerged. Many Republicans and some historians asserted that Wilson's killing was actually ordered by Michael Collins as a reprisal for the Belfast pogrom. And there's a number of other theories um, from, from within um, you know, well-informed Republican circles. Some believe that Collins had ordered the killing prior to the truce and that the killing was then subsequently carried out. Others believe it was a, an event which, which, was, which was, had been more recently um, ordered. If Wilson was killed as a reprisal for the Belfast pogrom, there's an irony here in the sense that, that Wilson, as it happened, had actually advised the Northern Irish government to curtail the excesses of the Ulster Special Constabulary. And again, quite similar to his, 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 his deploring of the activities of the Black and Tans, Wilson had argued that responsibility for security should be ceded to the army rather than to an ill-disciplined and partisan Special Constabulary, which was largely a loyalist, paramilitary, a loyalist state backed paramilitary force. Peter Hart's thorough analysis of a mass of contradictory sources and claims and allegations have led him to conclude that there was no firm evidence to support the numerous conspiracy theories linking Collins to the death of Wilson. It was true that plans had been drawn up by Rory O'Connor to assassinate Wilson along with many other senior British figures during the War of Independence, but these plans had never been implemented. <laughs> 
And while Collins would almost certainly have known of these plans, it seems unlikely, if not, if not impossible, that he would have reactivated these plans in 1922 when their outcome would have placed a provisional government under such enormous pressure. So Hart's thesis, which I find pretty compelling, is that the assassins of Sir Henry Wilson, Dunn and O'Sullivan, probably acted independently. And to get a, to understand why that might have come about, it's useful to get a clearer picture of Wilson's killer killers and the impact of the treaty split on the IRA in London. Now Dunn and O'Sullivan were born and raised um, in London. They were both from Irish Catholic family backgrounds and demonstrating the fluidity of wartime political allegiances, Reggie Dunn had actually enlisted in the British Army after the Easter Rising had taken place. Both of these men had volunteered for service in the First World War. Both were wounded and invalided out with good military records. In 1922, Reggie Dunn was unemployed, having dropped out of a teacher training um, course, and was clearly much more committed to, the, to, to his IRA activism than his career. O'Sullivan did have a job. He worked for the Ministry of Labour and he was also an IRA volunteer. Now, these two men were radicalised in much the same way as many young Irish men were radicalised in post-war Ireland at the same period. Drawn to the music and dancing of Stamford Hill's Gaelic League branch, Reggie Dunn embraced a powerful separatist Irish identity, forged through the same cultural impulses which politicised his generation of militant nationalists. Both men joined the Irish Volunteers in 1919, just as Irish membership in that movement was surging back home. And both men joined the IRB in late 1920. Despite his youth, Dunn would go on to lead the IRA in London by 1921, while O'Sullivan had become a dedicated volunteer, one of a relatively small number of London Republicans willing to carry out IRA executions. And I think in this, in this picture, you can perhaps see something of their, their, their demeanour. Uh, you can certainly see their youth. If you look closely, you can see also that they have been um, um, beaten. They were, after the assassination, they were chased down by uh, crowds of Londoners and then beaten probably by the crowds and also by the police um, who um, arrested them. But I think you can see in this picture something of a, a kind of a... Uh, a, a, an element of commitment and maybe a, a defined look despite the circumstances in which they have been um, captured. Now, to return to the circumstances leading up to the killing, by the summer of 1922, the Republican movement in London was essentially falling apart, just like the Republican movement um, across Ireland in response to the, to, the, to the split over the treaty. While many within the IRB backed Michael Collins, many within Sinn Féin and the IRA in London opposed the treaty. And a, a, a large number of the fighters, both in London and in Ireland, uh, the more committed kind of Irish volunteers were very much anti-treaty. So Reggie Dunn is finding himself sort of pulled in, in, in two directions and his response is to attempt to remain neutral and this attempt to kind of tread a line between the pro and anti-treaty factions um, in, in London is, is eroding his authority and adds to long-standing criticism of his leadership from other parts of the, the wider Republican movement in London. So this is a very young man in a very senior military position under intense uh, pressure. And I think against this kind of background of, of crisis, Dunn's actions may be understood uh, most usefully perhaps as an attempt to preserve both the unity of the IRA in London and also his own much diminished personal authority. To quote Peter Hart on this, it's not difficult to see how he might have sought to resolve his pressures and anxieties in some dramatic and patriotic way. Northern Ireland provided a natural focus, the one issue which united all his former comrades. And Wilson, whose assassination had been planned at least once before, provided an obvious target. Whatever about his personal motives, and they'll always 
uh, remain contested and, and, and impossible really to construct with any degree of certainty. Dunn's political motives, I think, are reasonably clear. His father told the police that his son had, quote, read deeply in the papers about the pogroms in Belfast, and I have seen the tears run down his face as he's been reading this. He has very fine feelings. Dunn, for his part, described the killing of Wilson as, quote, ridding the human world as a scourge. In short, the most likely explanation remains for, 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 the, for the targeting of Wilson remains the one given by Dunn and O'Sullivan at their trial. They acted alone and their actions were a spontaneous response to what they described as the Ulster Special Constabulary's reign of orange terror against Belfast Catholics. And I think this chimes with the last minute very haphazard nature of their operation, which actually contrasted with the, with the level of planning normally associated with, with, with IRA attacks. Um, and it would also account for their failure to declare themselves as IRA soldiers on their capture. So I don't want to suggest that the question of responsibility will ever be resolved given the mass of detailed conflicting Republican accounts. And many of them are insistent that Dunn and O'Sullivan were following some form of instructions. I think also, as Peter Hart has argued, it may be wrong to frame the question so narrowly as to ask whether Collins directly ordered the assassination. To quote Hart, in the welter of cliques, rumours and misinformation which engulfed the Irish Republican movement in 1922, there was probably enormous grey area between yes and no. Collins was faced with a barrage of crises, demands and decisions and was pulling every available lever to maintain some kind of control. He was simultaneously juggling the IRB, the various pro-treaty factions of the IRA, and the new National Army. He also continued to deal with and tried to manipulate elements of the anti-treaty IRA on issues such as Northern Ireland. It would not be surprising if amidst all of this, Collins or one of his men sent a message or made a remark which Dunn interpreted too literally or overzealously as giving him the authority to shoot Wilson. So I, I find this explanation of the idea of perhaps that the killing lacked a very clear cut chain of command orders, that there may have been a mix of, of, of reasons and motivations quite convincing. And I was struck by Peter Hart's um, nuanced take on the circumstances leading to the targeting of Wilson when I came across um, a statement by P.S. O'Hegarty, a very influential um, uh, and well-informed Republican uh, who, who has left behind in the Bureau of Military History um, witness statements, an account, a very intriguing account of his conversation with a leading London Republican, Sam McGuire, um, about this killing. And Sam McGuire is, would, be, would be well known to supporters of the GA as the, the figure whom the, the GA championship is named after. So this is rather a, a lengthy quote. So if you just bear with me, we'll, we'll go through it in some um, detail. So this is P.S. O'Hegarty writing in the 1950s, recalling his memory of the events of 1922. When Sir Henry Wilson was shot on 22nd of June 1922, the atmosphere here in Dublin was so tense with our local troubles that very little attention was paid to it. I thought it was either one of the groups who wanted to bring the British back in the foolish hope that that would solve our own dissensions, or else a Belfast group crazed by the pogroms there. But when in the course of a week, every group here who might conceivably have been responsible had categorically repudiated it, I was puzzled. I wondered whether it might have been a strictly London affair, and I resolved to myself that when I saw Sam McGuire, I would ask him, Sam will know, I said to myself. He, Sam McGuire, had come in to see me about something official in connection with his transfer, and when that had been disposed of, I said to him, do you know anything about the Wilson business? He said, what do you want to know about it? I said, who did it? He said, we did it. That made me stiffen up in horrified incredulity. I said, surely to God, Nick never authorised that. He was silent for a moment and then he said, Collins knew about it. I pressed him. Did he authorise it? He would not say that, but he repeated he knew about it and nothing else he would say. So again, this idea as, as uh, echoing Hart's point about maybe not an order given, but maybe something that wasn't prevented. 
Now later, um, P.S. O'Hegarty questioned Ben Kennedy, a Republican comrade of Maguire's, who gave him further information at the context that maybe might explain why the decision was made. For a long time, Sam was mad to shoot Wilson because of the Belfast pogroms. And every time he came over, he pressed Mick for authority and Mick invariably refused, but Sam persisted. The last time he saw him, they had high words about it and Mick lost his temper and flared up and said, God blast you, get away to hell out of that and don't bother me and do whatever you like. Sam left him without a word and although he was in Dublin several times afterwards, he never went near Mick again. When the thing happened, Mick was in an awful state. Anybody who saw Mick in the late spring and early summer of 1922, tired out, irritable, overburdened with, rot, with work and responsibility, some new worry every day, and all the time brooding over the taunts that were freely thrown at him of being a traitor and so on, he was extremely sensitive on that point, can see the thing happening just as Kennedy described it. I believe that what I've recorded does constitute the truth about this wretched business. It does not, it cannot remove from Mick the responsibility for it, but it does explain it. It is a sort of Greek tragedy. So I, I, I think, I mean, I don't know if this account is true. It's probably not true in, in, in all details, but I think it's very plausible in terms of the, the general dynamics that it's outlining, uh, which, which led to um, the action happening and, and particularly in the suggestion that it wasn't a clear cut, there wasn't a clear cut decision or responsibility um, that, that, that lay with Collins. On the other hand, this account suggests that, that, that Collins would have had some sense of responsibility for what have ha happened. And, and this account, if it's, or, or if, if something like it is true, this account of partial responsibility might explain Michael Collins's later support for the idea of breaking Dunn and a Sullivan out of prison seems a, a, a strange thing to do if he if he had nothing um, uh, to do to do with what had happened, and also some other curious details which you can find in the Bureau Bureau of Military um, History witness statements, such as for example the informal uh, gifting of a house to Dunn's distraught parents by Republicans who were connected to Collins. So certainly some of the people around Collins seem to have felt some kind of obligation to look after the family of Don and O'Sullivan, which pr presumably suggests there is, at least some of them believe there is a linkage between their actions and Collins's uh, responsibility. And while we'll never likely know the precise circumstances leading up to the killing, it seems reasonable to conclude that all three men were victims of the political vacuum which followed the treaty split. So at this point, having outlined the, the, the murky circumstances around uh, the killing and, and given a sense of who Wilson was and why he was targeted, I want to turn now to consider the impact and the legacy of the death of Wilson and also of his killers over time. And the key point I want to make is that family experiences often diverged very sharply from the kind of the, the political narratives which uh, framed the, the, the public memory of these acts of violence and indeed of the, the revolutionary dead who were responsible um, for them. So although Wilson enjoyed a, a heroic, even a kind of martyred status due to the manner of his death, the tensions between his family and the British government cast a shadow almost immediately, including over the funeral arrangements um, that, were, that were put in place for, for Wilson. So for example, although we find uh, the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George reminding MPs at Westminster of his friendship with Wilson on the day of his burial. Wilson's ministers were actually denounced as murderers by Lady Cecil, Henry Wilson's wife, for the reason that Wilson had never forgiven uh, the willingness of Lloyd George's government to settle with the IRA and, and, and regarded them really as having, having betrayed the sacrifices made by the British um, military during the conflict in Ireland. And in fact, at one point, Lady Wilson had to be dissuaded from forbidding Lloyd, Lloyd George to attend her husband's uh, funeral. Despite Wilson's regret, which was shared by Edward Carson at the sundering of the Union with Ireland, Wilson was quickly claimed, as Keith Jeffrey has noted in his biography, as a kind of founding martyr for the Northern Ireland state. And indeed, Wilson's uh, portrait hung in what was known as the Prime Minister's Room at Stormont for many decades. So the, 
there are various kind of ironies um, that emerge in terms of how Wilson's legacy is appropriated and used for different purposes by different political groupings, almost from the, the, the moment of his death. Wilson's fate, though, interestingly, met with, with far less sympathy from some other quarters in Britain. Drawing comparisons with Cahill Brewer, an equally zealous advocate of force and force alone, the liberal New Statesman uh, periodical observed that with his fanatical Orangism, great military prestige and inflammatory speeches, Wilson did more than any other man to promote that spirit of ruthless and stupid retaliation which led to his own death. If we look at the other side of the equation, we can see that the relationship between the families of Don and O'Sullivan and the Irish state, which emerges from the Irish Revolution, is also characterized by similar um, tensions. Both the families of Don and O'Sullivan, uh, for example, fought long public campaigns to have Dunn and O'Sullivan officially recognized as soldiers of the IRA. And that was a status that the provisional government at the time denied to the two men, you know, claiming that they had no responsibility for what he did. But interestingly, it's also a status that, that subsequent governments, including the governments of Fianna Fáil in the 1930s, would also deny. I mean, it would have been politically very problematic to, to, to claim that these men had done what they did in some sort of official um, capacity. And notwithstanding numerous appeals by Republican comrades, the insistence of both pro-treaty and anti-treaty Republicans that the two men had acted on orders received. And also, despite the argument that the Irish government had a certain moral responsibility, given Collins' alleged promise that if anything happened to Dunn and O'Sullivan, their parents would be looked after, neither Dunn nor O'Sullivan's parents were judged to meet the criteria for the allowance paid to dependents of volunteers who died in military service. And that was central to the, to the, to the, the tensions and the resentments that the family would have had um, with uh, the state. Uh, Joe O'Sullivan's elderly father, for example, campa campaigned in vain for the public recognition of both volunteers as what he described as soldiers of the Irish Republic who died bravely as soldiers. And of course, the circumstances of the violence that they had committed were certainly, as, as well as the political sensitivities, but the, but the type of violence too were, were certainly part of the sensitivities around um, this question. Reggie Dunn's mother, Mary, is described in the military service pensions collection as being unhinged by her loss. And she too, like O'Sullivan's father, continued to hope for what was described as some recognition from the Irish government and the Irish people of her son's sacrifice for Ireland up until her death. And that was a vain um, hope. So to bring this uh, talk uh, towards a conclusion, I would like to return to the three themes that I mentioned at the outset. Um, firstly, the interconnected nature of the conflicts that occurred during the revolution. Um, secondly, the, the complexity of of political and national identities in revolutionary Ireland and Britain um, during this period. Um, and thirdly, um, how, how we remember and commemorate revolutionary violence um, subsequently. Uh, Wilson's death uh, and its consequences demonstrates, I think, how the Republican violence of the War of Independence the sectarian violence that swept Ulster between 1920 and 1922, and the fratricidal Republican violence of the Irish Civil War were often intimately interconnected. And I think we can see each of these conflicts as kind of aftershocks of the First World War. And we have very similar types of conflict, wars of succession, civil wars, ethno-nationalist and sectarian conflicts taking place across much of Central and Eastern Europe where empires uh, collapse and fragment in the years after the First World War. So we can see what's happening in Ireland as perhaps a, a, a paler um, shadow of very similar um, violence and other um, shatter zones of the empire as they have been described. And interestingly, in seeking to justify his actions, it was to the First World War that Reggie Dunn 
uh, turned when he made uh, a speech during his trial, which, which he elaborated on in, in, in a letter um, um, subsequently. Um, addressing the jury, he attributed his actions in part to his role in the First World War fought for the right of small nations to self-determination. He declared, those principles I found as an Irishman were not applied to my own country, and I have endeavoured to strike a blow for it. So I guess the point here is that I think we can, we, we can take seriously the idea that the conflicts in Ireland uh, are interconnected in the sense that they, they, are, they are ripples of the, the wider kind of national forces of nationalism, anti-imperialism, loyalism and so on that, that are unleashed in the years after um, the First World uh, War. The second uh, key theme that I wanted to emphasise is the idea of identities. The story of the Irish-born imperialist cut down by Londoners exemplifies not only the, the complexity of identities in the revolutionary period, but reminds us of how the revolutionary violence of 1913 to 1923 narrowed subsequent understandings of Irish and British identity. In other words, the violence of the revolution polarised identities to the extent that subsequently they were, they were remembered in more simplistic ways. Although Wilson belonged to a Protestant landowning unionist family who believed, as Keith Jeffrey put it, themselves to be fully Irish and as emotionally attached to Ireland as anyone, Henry Wilson embodied an imperial Irish tradition that really didn't survive the revolutionary era, at least in Southern Ireland. And in fact, as early as 1917, we find Henry Wilson's brother, Jemmy, lamenting how what he describes as, quote, the oases of culture, of uprightness and of fair dealing sustained by his landlord class whose blood is so freely shed for the empire, who for years have done their best to discharge their onerous and often thankless duties by their humble neighbours all over Ireland, were giving way to a desert of dead uniformity, where the poor will have no one to appeal to except the priest or the local shopkeeper. Reflecting on what he describes as the Irish tragedy that was Henry Wilson's death, Wilson's biographer Keith Jeffrey observes that although this romantic, solipsistic, anti-democratic um, vision of paternalistic conservatism was really out of touch with the real Ireland on the ground, in its combination of local, national and imperial service, it exemplified the Wilson's worldview and what they conceived their duty to be in this era. And in fact, all four Wilson brothers had left Lamford by the time of Henry's killing, and the remaining physical traces of their presence there were obliterated by the burning of the family home of Curry Grain House within days of the hanging of Wilson, of, of O'Sullivan and Dunn. Our only crime, Major Cecil Wilson, Henry's brother, reflected plaintively in his claim for compensation to the Irish Grants Committee sometime later, was that we tried to help this country. But this country arguably no longer existed. Like other multinational kingdoms across much of Central and Eastern Europe, that country, which had been, uh, which in the views of Wilson saw Ireland as part of the United Kingdom, had come to an end. Whether considered poignant or deserved, Wilson's fate exemplifies one of the era's most enduring legacies which continue to undermine reconciliation in Ireland, the polarizing of identities affected by political violence. So I want to end by um, thinking about how we remember such acts of revolutionary violence 100 years on. As we've seen with the recent controversy over President Higgins' decision not to attend a religious service commemorating partition, how we recall this period of history retains the capacity to destabilize the politics of the present. Should we remember events such as Wilson's killings, Wilson's killing in ways that complicate the narrative, to quote a much used phrase from the centenary of 1916? Or will contentious acts of violence, perhaps even this contentious act of violence, be commemorated in simplistic and binary ways that will reinforce the entrenched narratives of the revolutionary period, a, a, a green and an orange, a unionist and a nationalist narrative of what occurred. And interestingly, we have a kind of a, 
a trial run or a, an, an example from, from, from earlier history in thinking about how this event has been remembered. In 1967, uh, following a long campaign by family members and Republican supporters, the remains of Reggie Dunn and Joe O'Sullivan were returned to Ireland for burial. And on 8th of July 1967, Dunn and O'Sullivan finally received a public funeral benefiting their status as heroic patriots who, who had died in the cause of the Irish Republic. And the timing is interesting, 1967, two years before the Troubles begins. And we find that the British uh, government is very concerned, and in fact, their concern is shared in Dublin, that this public funeral might jeopardise, quote, the present delicate state of affairs in Northern Ireland. But despite this concern shared in Dublin, the ceremony in Dublin's pro-cathedral was attended by representatives of the Taoiseach and the President. After the funeral, we find a different form of commemoration taking place. To quote the news, one newspaper account, young men moving with military precision formed an escort party, while a Londoner named Sean Stevenson, who would be, soon become much better known as Sean McStephon, the provisional IRA's founding chief of staff, provided the oration at Dean's Grange Cemetery's Republican plot. And of course, this Republican commemoration of these two uh, Figures once neglected, um, denied, uh, now being reclaimed as, as part of the Republican struggle, was grist to the mill of militant loyalist uh, elements bubbling to the surface in Northern Ireland as Terence O'Neill's efforts to reform unionism and the Northern Irish state began to run aground. In Belfast, for example, uh, Ian Paisley roused what was described by the newspaper as a great Protestant demonstration to protest Prime Minister Harold Wilson's decision to return the remains of the two volunteers. While Dublin honours the murderers, Belfast honours the, the martyr, declared Paisley. The next morning, back in Dublin, foregrounding the bloodletting that would follow just two years later on the streets of Northern Ireland, three young Republican men fired a volley over the graves of Dunn and O'Sullivan. So this kind of rallying of the faithful, whether by Republicans or by loyalists, um, shows how commemoration show, is a good example of forms of commemoration that maybe close down opportunities to learn from the past or to question the past or to tease out the complexities and tensions that, um, that lie in the past. Re-examining figures such as Wilson and his killers in our decade of centenaries presents us with opportunities for a more thoughtful engagement with difficult history. But I think this kind of engagement is not without its challenges for both Republicans and Unionists. In some ways, the simple narratives are more compelling and certainly more politically useful than any assessment of, of, of the complications and the gray areas. In terms of challenges for Unionists, I think from a Northern Irish Unionist perspective, Wilson's imperial politics haven't aged particularly well. Um, and there's an interesting local connection to consider here um, with the following image, which is actually from Lisburn Museum's own uh, collection. Um, on 19th of January 1922, when the statue of John Nicholson, the Brigadier General who put down the Indian Rebellion of 1857 with great ruthlessness was unveiled, Sir Henry Wilson was the main attraction at that event. Henry Wilson regaled the crowd with tales of how Nicholson had defeated, quote, the most savage, the most warlike and the most terrible tribes of India. A Lisburn urban district councillor contrasted the achievements of Nicholson and Wilson with the efforts of nationalists to tear down and dismember the British Empire that men like Nicholson, Cecil Rhodes and others had died to build up. And in December 1922, and this is where this picture is from, a second ceremony is held in Lisburn uh, town centre, memorialising not only Nicholson's birth at the, at the site of the new statue, but also, of course, the killing of Wilson, who, who was by far the most prominent Irish imperial officer of his generation. And I think a century on, in the light of campaigns such as Rhodes uh, Must Fall, that imperial Irish legacy, bound up as it is, at least in part, with the racism 
and the violence of an empire that no longer exists can no longer function as a symbol of Northern Irish unionist identity and pride in the way that it clearly did for Wilson's generation one century ago. The whole idea of an imperial identity has become deeply problematic. But I think the fate of Wilson and that of his generation of Southern unionists also raises challenging questions for republicanism and for nationalism. For example, an ethical remembrance of the fate of Wilson Dunn and O'Sullivan might emphasize the costs as well as the achievements of revolutionary um, violence. Republicans might ask themselves whether independent Ireland lost something with the departure of people of Wilson's background, many of whom left Ireland for, for a wide range of different reasons in the aftermath of the Irish Revolution and brought with them their connections, their knowledge, um, their abilities, and so on. Now, of course, at the time, the fate of families like the Wilsons engendered little sympathy from many publicans. It was a good day for Ireland. That day, yourself and your hero of a companion went out and slayed the second Cromwell dead at your feet. Joe O'Sullivan was assured by his cousin. I have no regrets as it was done for the love of his fate and for Ireland. Joe's father confided to Sean T. O'Kelly, vice president of the executive council in 1933. We are very proud of his actions as he removed a dirty orange dog. So, I mean, there's lots that can be said in favour of a shared history, but I think any kind of genuine history of this period of time must reflect honestly about the depth of divisions and, and, and animosities and also the very different political motivations, the ideological motivations, whether imperialism or anti-imperialism, which we need to, to bear in mind to think about why people behaved and acted in the ways that they did. Is a century enough time to allow for acknowledgement of the impact of revolutionary violence in narrowing understandings of Irish identity and in complicating efforts to achieve reconciliation or unity thereafter? So I want to end with a quote from Keith Jeffrey's biography of Wilson, which again points to the complexities of identities um, from this period. And I think both Wilson and his killers exemplify the, the, the complexity of Irish and British identities across the two islands in the aftermath of the revolutionary era, e even if we tend to remember those identities in more, and events in more simplistic terms. So to quote Keith, if we are to comprehend the modern and contemporary relationship between Britain and Ireland, we need to understand people like Wilson who are neither orange nor green and appreciate that the relationship within and between the neighbouring islands cannot be reduced to a simple Manichaean duality. Wilson, for all his apparently simple, unswerving loyalty, was influenced by and possessed of plural allegiances, which the partitioned post-1922 Ireland could not readily accommodate. Ireland made him, and Ireland killed him. And I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. Virgil, thanks very much for a um, really interesting talk there. It was, it was great to get you to hear your thoughts on um, Sir Henry Wilson and, and his legacy and, and what happened to him. Um, I suppose your, your last slide there is something that's important to us in the museum, which is the, the Nicholson statue. And, and it was interesting um, in, in summer, as we were chatting off camera, um, it was interesting that um, some were calling for perhaps the Nicholson statue to be re-evaluated. Um, but that's not something that we would necessarily necessarily hear on the ground in Lisbon. It's not necessarily something that we hear that, that that's shared. So there seems to be an appreciation, a love for this um, imperial Irish identity um, or an admiration for it, at least. I'm just keen to hear your thoughts on, on, on the statue and the topic. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting one and it's, and it's, and it's a difficult question. Um, what to do with statues and whether they should be removed or whether they should be contextualized. And I, to be honest, I haven't thought deeply about that particular statues. And I think historians don't find, find this an, an easy question to deal with. I think, um, I think if you have a landscape which is saturated in particular kind of values, values of imperialism or militarism or so on. That's a, that's a snapshot, I suppose, of the period of time in which those statues went up. And the, the one kind of key uh, um, message that I think historians who look at 
a, a public memory would say over time, which is important, is that memory is never static. Statues come, statues go. And I think there's a need for a kind of, a, and this, this is not easily done, but kind of a calm debate about the appropriateness of statues, whether statues should be removed or whether they should be supplemented. Um, I think one thing, I mean, I think another way in which I'd address it, because it seems sort of sitting on the fence a little bit, because I don't really want to wade in with an, with an opinion here, because I don't think it's really the job of the historian necessarily. I'm much more kind of con comfortable contextualizing um, the, the attitudes and, and, and how they have changed over time. But but I, th I think Wilson's uh, and, and that statue's presence tell us very interesting things about how empire and imperialism is, is regarded. And, and something that really interesting that happens in 1922, and um, historians such as Michael Silvestri have written about this in very interesting ways, is that really you get, as part of this kind of polarization that I was talking about, you, you get two kind of exaggerated views to imperialism taking place north and south of Ireland. So in, in, in the south of Ireland, even though many sort of nationalists have been very willing, sort of, you know, complicit in empire in all sorts of ways, for jobs, resources, wealth, and staffing the army and so on. Um, you get a sort of a, the state begins to form an identity which is anti-imperial. And you see this really in a really interesting way between 1922 and 1932, because the, the free state government is sort of stuck with the empire because it's embedded in the treaty. But that, 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 those imperial symbols are probably really the reason why the free state politically collapses. There's just no nationalist appetite to, um, to, 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 um, to think about the empire. And in a sense, the, the imperial trappings delegitimize the Irish free state. And what we get in the 1930s is a kind of a, a kind of an Irish state, which, which sort of defines itself in, in opposition to imperial values. And you get something, almost the opposite process taking place north of the border where um, unionists in particular, I think, ground their new identity and the new identity of the state in orange and imperial kind of um, trappings. And you get a sort of, you get then, I think, a, a view towards empire, which, which, which probably be, over time, you know, differs from how empire is, is regarded and certainly is regarded now in, in much of the rest of, of Britain. And I think it's to do with the, the place that empire has in terms of the national identity, the, the political identity of unionism, but also the identity of the state. I mean, one thing that's really striking about 1922 is that the state sort of fashions its identity around commemoration of, of, the, of the First World War in particular. So there's very little commemoration, there's almost no commemoration of partition, there's very little commemoration of um, the violence of 1920 to 1922 that actually secures the, the, the state itself. Rather, we have a sort of a going back to the Psalm and to 1916 and further back to the Ulster Covenant. And again, south of the border, something similar. The Civil War, even the Republican violence of the War of Independence is, is, is difficult to, to commemorate. And so you have a going back to 1916, both kind of north and south, you, you get these kind of these ideas of, well, certain types of violence should be commemorated if they're seen as noble or sacrificial, and other types of violence, which are much more brutal, like the killing of Wilson, are, are, are kind of forgotten. And with, with the burning of his house um, in Curry Green, um, are we, are we to see that as purely as a reaction to the hanging uh, of uh, the, the two men in London, or is that seen as part of that wider process of the burning of the big houses, which has all that agrarian economic class um, baggage um, packaged in there too? Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm not actually sure because I haven't looked into any detail about, about the circumstances of the burning. And I think it'd be really interesting to know if there's some kind of local community lore because there's, there's often not a written record, but there is a knowledge about why, why these things happen. I think the timing is really interesting. The timing being so close suggests that it was some kind of symbolic act of violence. But you're, you're, you're quite right to put it into that kind of context. We've like relatively small numbers of big houses. This is kind of like a more of a middle house, but certainly to, to, to Catholic nationalist farmers in, in the surrounding areas, it would have seemed like probably a, a generous house and a generous portion of land. Mm -hmm. And you, you, in comparison to the War of Independence in 1922, you just have a huge levels of kind of um, arson and burning down of houses and so on. And in fact, it's not just big houses, but, but arson more, more generally. There's some really good work um, by historians such as Gemma Clark, which is looking at the extent to which this is happening. And anybody who's really written about these burnings tends to make the same point or, or makes emphasizes one important point, which is that it's sort of impossible to disentangle 
the, the political or even the sectarian motives at work from, from the kind of social agrarian kind of tensions, you know, and so you, one, one could be at the same time an IRA volunteer and one also could be someone who, who, who wants to get your hand on, 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 on the land, you know, and usually you find it's really quite murky. But I think it's going back to my earlier point about how post-1922 you begin to have sort of two identities. I think there's a deeply symbolic um, aspect to the, the removal from the landscape of so many symbols of, of unionism and empire. And it's not just big houses, although that's a particularly kind of striking one, but even thinking about things like statues of, of British monarchs and so on, you just have a kind of a, 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 a destruction of various different kind of icons and, and aspects of the landscape, which I think is really interesting and probably needs to be thought about um, a little, it would, with a little bit more kind of complexity and, uh, and, and ambivalence. Yeah, just on that point, actually, there's a really interesting case um, during the Swansea Rats in Lisburn. Um, and in terms of timing, there's a major cattle dealer on the very edge of town, far away from where a lot of the damage happens. And he has like 10,000 um, head of cattle. And they're sort of suggesting that perhaps that's less to do with the rats and it's more um, opportunism to get back at somebody who's a major cattle dealer and... and um, and take them out of business um, and I'm wondering if they capitalized on that opportunity you know and the timing to to get rid of a rival um, yeah uh, no I, 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 I it's quite 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 possibly I, I think we sort of tend to want to ascribe particular acts to one clear motive like the, the, the political or the sectarian and I think a really good example of this is the violence that's happening in Belfast between 1920 and 1922 and obviously what happens in Lisbon is a really important part of that kind of and triggering kind of what, what, what wider waves but you know there's obviously very important economic dimensions to that whether it's rivalries between different communities resentment of maybe catholics becoming publicly visible in certain kind of uh, areas but the, the one example which comes to mind i think is that the, the, the violence in the shipyards um, now, now one of the things that the shipyards were, were facing in this period is they really had to get rid of some some workers. The the um, the, the the economy was was shifting into recession. There was no longer room for for um, the same kind of level of workers. So so partly what's happening with the expulsion of Catholic workers, even though it's done very much in the guise that they're disloyal, is it's you know the uh, loyalists are economically um, securing their 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 jobs. So I think there's a there's, there's there's always a kind of a greater complexity to all of this than than we tend to ascribe when we kind of when, when we write the history placing politics at the center of everything yeah. i think it's, it's it's really worthwhile doing it from the bottom up with the kind of instance that you're talking about where you where you really can do a kind of a grand up sense of what the specific motives in local communities may be because they're nearly always very um complicated and um interconnected i think oh, okay and um, just to the q a and um, timothy has asked um how active in terms of violence were the london republicans during the war of independence was this assassination extremely unusual for the London branch of the Republican movement or the RV? Uh, yeah, it was. They, were, they weren't particularly um, active. I mean, I think there were practical reasons. It would have been kind of difficult to operate in that kind of environment. But I think there are also strategic reasons. You actually have a lot of uh, uh, people in the IRA, a lot of uh, Irish volunteers in, in Britain, but their, their really important role is kind of in, in logistics and supporting the revolution back in Ireland. So for example, when you have the IRA in, in Liverpool burning down some docks and so on, it brings enormous kind of attention onto the IRA and people are interned and arrested and so on. And it, and it, it makes the volunteers much less useful as a kind of a logistical way of supporting what's going on back in Ireland. So it seems to have been, you know, in, in, in part, violence would have been quite difficult, but also just a conscious decision then that, that having, the, having Irish people in Britain was quite use, useful for a range of reasons, but, but as a kind of a, an extra front in the conflict, that, that wasn't a primary use. And, and actually, Jim has quite an interesting question here. Do you think the killers intended um, some kind of martyrdom? Considering one had, a, had lost a leg in World War I, um, their escape would have been difficult. It's a good question. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, they're, 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 I mean, I'm sort of faced with the, 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 the limits of the, the sources. It's, it's hard to know. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to see how they, they thought they could, you know, get away with it. And the efforts that they made to do so were really limited. There's just, I mean, there's, if you, if you, if you look closely at what they were doing at the time, there's lots of oddities. Like, for example, one of the two men went to work um, on, on the day of the assassination. There's just very, 
it, 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 it's it's going back to your early question about the IRA. When the IRA did do operations in London, they tend to be very well kind of planned and you know, logistics and getaways and all this kind of. There doesn't seem to have been that in place. So I, I think the idea, as I was kind of suggesting in the talk, very much drawing on on, on people like Peter Hart, is I, I, I think we can see it as a kind of. Um, it's a response to, to the crisis that the IRA was in. And also it's worth kind of bearing in mind just how chaotic everything is in the summer of 1922. I mean, one of the things I'm often struck by is that I think we sort of take for granted that when the revolution ended, there would be an Irish free state and a Northern Irish state, and both of these things would be quite durable and, and go on forever. But I think if you're looking at things from perspective of early 1922 or mid-1922, the, the whole Irish settlement is much more kind of open. I mean, there's so many different things that can... Um, happen. I think in terms of motivations, the, the idea that Dunn and Sullivan hoped perhaps to keep the IRA together in London, I mean, that seems kind of plausible, or they, they hoped perhaps to prevent the, um, the, 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 the divisions between the anti-treatyites, the four courts and the pro-treatyites. And if you look at, at, what, at what Collins is doing, I mean, all sorts of extraordinary things are happening in this period. I mean, Collins is getting guns from the British government and exchanging them with anti-treatyites in the south so that the weapons can go up to the north to defend um, uh, Belfast Catholics. Um, Collins is, despite having signed the treaty, is sort of um, supporting, you know, to an extent, efforts by the IRA to, to, um, to move against the northern. So uh, I think there's a, there's, there's a lot more chaos and anarchy than we, we kind of uh, remember um, looking back on the period. Yeah, okay. And um, so Sean has a question. Um, would it not have suited Collins' agenda to force a showdown between the British government and the anti-treaty IRA? I think that's a an, an comment on some of your remarks earlier on. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, it, maybe the question is suggesting that Collins had uh, hoped to sort of to fix the blame on the anti-treatyites in the four courts, but I, I think he, he probably would have had no confidence about that. My sense is that the in London, the, 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 the British government and intelligence didn't know who had done the killing or why they had done the killing, but it really suited them for political purposes to pin it on the anti-treatyites mm -hmm. because they had been pressing um, the, the provisional government to basically do something about the, the four courts. And that, again, it goes back to this question of, you know, the whole Irish settlement seemed kind of, kind of open. It, it wasn't clear that Collins was going to establish the free state and move against the anti-treaty IRA at this, mm -hmm. at this point. And Britain's options were, were kind of limited. Why I, I'm kind of skeptical, I know a lot of people do buy into the idea that Collins ordered the assassination. Why I'm kind of skeptical of that is, I think the implications of Britain re retaliating in Ireland would have been so profound. It essentially would have been, I think, the falling apart of the treaty settlement had British military forces gone back into to Ireland. Yeah. And you, you, there's, there's similar moments in this period where it seems possible on the border. You know, kidnappings are taking place across the border. The British military are coming uh, are co coming back out of the barracks and taking over, you know, places like Petago and Belique where there was a border mm -hmm. dispute. So all that's kind of up for grabs. But uh, it's, it's, I mean, Collins was a very re reckless figure, but it's hard, I, I find it hard to see how it was politically in his advantage to, to plunge the, the state into this crisis. And of course, he does move against the anti-treaty IRA. And we know that he was very deeply ambivalent about having to move against his colleagues. I don't think he was Machiavellian. It wasn't something he found it easy to do. And in yeah. fact, he's, he seems to be constantly looking for opportunities to, to stop the civil war and to, to reach some kind of political settlement. Yeah, OK. And um, two last questions from the Q&A. Here's a quick one. This is an interesting one because I noticed this too one day driving through Lock Brooklyn. There's a Henry Wilson Hall. Um, <laughs> and there's a question saying, do you know any local connection? I, I'm not sure what the reason for that is. There, it, there may be a mention of it in, in, in Keith Jeffrey's published work, but um, what I mean, I was quite struck by the idea that um, Keith Jeffrey really questions the idea of, of, of Wilson as an Orangeman. He doesn't mm -hmm. see him as that tradition. Um, Henry Wilson is someone who's very kind of, you, you see this um, quite often in, in British circles, he's very disparaging of the kind of the populist sectarianism of what he would see as the, the loyalist or, 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 or orange tradition. So he's not, he's, I mean, this is, I mentioned as one of the kind of perhaps the ironies of his reputation. He's not automatically a figure that you would, you would expect to become a kind of a poster boy for, for the Northern Ireland government. He yeah. was rather, he was one of those Irish unionists. He wasn't an orange or an Ulster unionist who was deeply, you know, ambivalent about 
you know, what Alvin Jackson has really um, interestingly explored, the kind of the narrowing of identities which happens within, within unionism, you know, and, and, and Republicans, but particularly within unionism in this period. It, it, considering his say his views on the on the Ulster Special Contact, Constabulary and Security and whatnot, could, like if he had remained in post, could it like would have he been a useful sort of ally? Um, like, would he have played an important like foil to Craig or or um, others in in the Northern Ireland Parliament? I, I think not. I think I, I think he was essentially. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on this, but my sense is that his his advice was seen as not very helpful or useful, and he was kind of ignored. And I mean, it, it's hard to see, you know, one influential, even though he's one individual, even though he's obviously very influential, kind of reshaping the forces at work. I mean, what's really st- striking to me um, is the extent to which um, Craig and figures like Dawson Bates, very hardline kind of Minister of Home Affairs. Um, really opt for that kind of quite repressive response to the to the you know the significant threat that exists from the the the, uh, the Catholic minority within the state and also from Republicans outside the state. In I mean I think the Ulster Special Constabulary are, are fifty thousand strong. You have you know some really terrible um, events, um, uh, murders such as the McMahon murders. While they're not ordered by the the Northern Irish state. You do get the sense that the Northern Irish state at the highest level doesn't see, it, see itself as able to push back against that kind of populist sort of loyalism on the streets. So I, 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 my sense would be that what, what Wilson is advocating, that there should be some kind of British military or proper policing response to this, that just wasn't the course that, that, um, that, that happened. I think what you're looking at is really the, and this goes back to maybe one of the themes of the lecture about thinking about the nature of revolutionary violence, we really have some pretty ugly violent forces on the ground that are perhaps beyond um, much, much control. But it's certainly, you don't get to say the sense from, from, from the new state that they're, that, that they're terribly worried about what the implications of having a very repressive draconian kind of suppression um, uh, of, of the type that, that occurred in 1920, And with, with the publication of Lady Wilson's, um, of, of her publication of Sir Henry Wilson's diaries, did that negatively affect his reputation? That's a question from Mary. Yeah, it did. And again, Keith Jeffries, well worth reading on this. I mean, I, th- I think um, the, she had sponsored a couple of individuals to, to, to write an account, a biography of him and then to publish, uh, then publish his diaries, I think, which were published and also her account. And I think it was actually quite counterproductive because he, his, his diaries were really pretty scandalous and he was seen as someone who was like a really politically meddling in a way that a British military officer wouldn't. He wasn't popular with a lot of other British military officers because he was seen as someone who got to the top partly by by um, uh, by by being a sort of a, a, a politician more rather than soldier. So actually, yeah, it was it was quite the, the effect in terms of his, his political reputation was quite quite damaging. And it wasn't uh, until perhaps more recently, particularly with Keith Jeffries' work, that he's been kind of re- reevaluated and, and remembered as the sort of the very important military figure that he was, particularly during the the, the First World War um, era. Okay, and the, and the last question. This is a qu- question we've asked everybody who's appeared so far. Um, so the museum's launched a centenary exhibition and we're asking speakers, you know, if they had to put on an exhibition or display, what object or what objects from the last 100 years would they, would they think of including in the display? Not to put you on the spot. Everyone's, everyone <laughs> everyone's thinks back into their seat <laughs> when we ask that, but usually they deliver. Uh, well, two, 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 two that spring to mind, and I don't know if they exist or could be found, would be, uh, from, from, from this talk, would be... Um, uh, um, uh, O'Sullivan's leg and uh, and General Wilson's sword, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I think that could maybe start some conversations in in in, in Lisbon. <laughs> yeah, there might be some ethical considerations about the one today, but yeah, that, that's great. Thanks very much, and um, um, that's the end of our, our Q and A. But thanks very much for your time, Fergal. Um, it's been fantastic having you um, speaking for us. Um, thanks to the Heritage Fund Shared History Fund who have um, supported the talk tonight and their other talks in the centenary series. Our final talk is up on the 18th of November and it's not so much a talk as a discussion. It's chaired by BBC NI's Stephen Watson. It's looking at sport, the history of sport and identity over the last 100 years. And it'd be wonderful if you'd all join us um, for that. So um, thanks again. Uh, Good night and see you on the 18th of November. Thanks for having me, Karen. Pleasure as always.